Hello and welcome back to Ave Imperator Productions. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at two concepts, scientific management and Taylorism. So before we get too far into this, I want to give a brief overview on the history of managers and management especially in the United States, because the United States actually had a lot to give. The concept of scientific management has actually been considered one of the greatest cultural contributions of the United States to the Western world for a multitude of reasons. And as we go through these processes and these explanations, you'll begin to see how scientific management and Taylorism have actually come to dominate a lot of the modes of thought within our society without most people even really knowing what they are at all. So, managers and management, the rise of the management class. The word to manage actually comes from an old Italian word from about the 13th century, which was menagiare, which meant to manage a horse specifically. And this word was used because a horse is an animal with its own will, and it must be directed, and it must also be controlled, but it's never a complete controlling, and it's also more than simply administering the movements of the animal. Over several centuries, menagiare came to different languages in English as the word manage, and was used in a much broader context to denote a word that was between administration administration being simply a soft sort of direction and direct domination in which you could completely control all aspects of a living being. There are many early modern paintings of kings and um, emperors and people like this who are shown on a horse gently moving the horse with different movements and with different controls to show that they could direct their own empire much the same way that they could direct an individual or something like a horse. So the word manage and manager came to much greater prominence with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And as these large companies, these large factories came to uh, grow and coalesce and become bigger and bigger, it was no longer possible for individuals to completely control the actions of the companies which they had started. The managers were on the rise at a very similar time to another concept which is heavily criticized, especially in our society today, that being bureaucracy. It's sort of interesting. A bureaucrat works for the government or some sort of large non-private sector uh, corporation such as that, and they do different tasks to help to administer and control the flow of power that the head official isn't capable of doing alone. And they are also a force of rationalization. The idea behind managers and bureaucrats. Managers, by the way, are little more than private sector bureaucrats. The role of these was to rationalize the world and be able to break everything down into a simple format which could be controlled, predicted, and improved for the sake of efficiency. Efficiency being something of a new goal which came about also with the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the rationalist mindset. So, management was not originally a science. There were a few business schools that were started in the 1860s and 1870s in the United States specifically, and these were aimed at teaching people that were something a little bit more than clerks than the way that we see managers today in breaking unions and in centralizing power. And between 1870 and 1890, there was what was called the Long Depression. And the Long Depression was one of the greatest economic upheavals in United States and possibly world history. It was about a 20 year long depression. And much of this resulted from the fact that the business markets were so quickly moving and different companies would rise and fall seemingly overnight. It was individual owners pitted against each other and someone always had to lose. And when that person lost, their organization lost. And with this came the threat of many people losing out. 
And so with this constant friction, there were different people that attempted to figure out ways to get around the volatility of the markets and to stabilize. One of these people was John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller quickly figured out that the best way to stabilize a company against economic shocks and uncertainty was to make it as large and integrated as possible. Rockefeller was not an early manager. He was still a business owner and he still very much wanted to direct the affairs of his corporations individually and from his own perspective. But with the uh, realization that much larger companies were needed to necessarily make it through different kinds of economic downturns. The ability of an individual to control such a large corporation such as his Standard Oil became very tenuous and with this a new kind of person was needed. Someone that wasn't in direct control of the company but had the authority to control different aspects and who had goals which they needed to achieve in order to prove that the direction of the company was going in the right way. And these were the managers. And an interesting thing happened, especially with the busting up of trusts and with the uh, ever larger companies, individual owners came to the point where they could no longer actually own their own companies. And they were replaced generally with boards and with stockholders. And once this had happened, the administration and control of the company fell completely upon the managers. And these people became what the original owners had actually become. Even though they had very little stake, they could be hired and fired. If they didn't achieve the goal that they wanted, the entire company didn't go under, they could be replaced. But they were still the ones exerting the authority to move the company and to affect the economic position. And with this, they wanted to hedge against doubt and they wanted to strictly rationalize the system so that they could explain what could happen, what needed to happen, and give themselves as much control as possible to make sure that different kinds of economic activities and different kinds of uh, problems that could arise could be mitigated. And with this, the search was on for a new scientific management. Enter Frederick Winslow Taylor, the person whose name is given to the concept of Taylorism and the inventor of what we call scientific management, which is so pervasive to our culture and the way that our businesses and our social interactions actually work today in the modern world. Taylor was an engineer in a steel plant when he first started out but he was obsessed with the concept of efficiency and he wanted to be more than just an engineer designing things he wanted to be specifically a manager the only problem was managers had a lack of legitimacy and prestige because they weren't seen as anything all that necessarily important or all of that uh, mentally necessary there were still very few business schools uh, in different universities and many of the first including the business school at Harvard would come to take on the ideas and the concepts directly from Taylor to build the prestige and legitimacy of these business schools which would become major cash cows for the university systems so Taylor coupled his almost obsession with the idea of quantifying and scientifically arranging processes for uh, integrated and better management and production with an extreme distaste for the workers who were actually in these plants and in these factories making different kinds of goods. There were multiple levels of skill included in the different crafts and in the different factories which were producing everything from pig iron to steel to glass to furniture to just about anything else that you can imagine and because in the beginning when factories were first set up between the 1830s and the 1870s um, even really up until the 1890s there was very little mechanical processes there was very few machines and it was mostly a grouping of different craftsmen and the idea being that if you had everybody producing the same thing at the same time in accordance with each other, you could more quickly uh, get products out and increase what was called the throughput of the factory. 
There was only one problem with this. If you were a manager and you wanted to increase the throughput of your factory, you needed to be able to quantify what your different workers were doing, how they were interacting with the products, what the efficiency was, and different topics like this. But all you could really do was observe the fact that different workers were better or worse, and that overall the different skills seemed to be a bit more en enigmatic than would lend itself to what could be called a scientific process. So Taylor came up with what was called his time and motion studies. And the Taylor time and motion studies were essentially taking different crafts and their skills and recording how long it took for them to actually complete it, what the steps were, marking the amount of movement that there was, and the overall aim was to break down these different craft abilities into tasks and subtasks. These tasks and subtasks were the minimum amount of energy, movement, and time that was required for each step along the process of a different item being made. Originally, the craft workers, as I said, would come together in the factories, they would each make their own product, and at the end they would have a finished item, which they could point to as having been something that they had made, that they had produced for their society and passed on, and then it went into the rest of the factory. With these time and motion studies, it was attempted to take the individual processes of the glass making, of the iron smelting, of all of these different processes, and remove the individual's ability to create any one item because it was necessary to break it down as simply as possible and to arrange it into a system which could be studied, which could be observed. And in, if you've ever worked in an office today, you've probably heard of the term best practices. This is a Taylorist term and it comes from the idea that because this style of management is scientific, that there is one best way to do everything and that one way needs to be as simple as possible and needs to be tightly controlled so that the efficiency of the individual workers can be checked, can be monitored, and can be maintained. This led to what was known as the table system. And the table system is probably going to sound pretty familiar because it is the direct forerunner to the um, production line, the only difference being that the production line required more machinery and more specialized tools, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what was the table system? The table system was where they took these factory workers and they would have one specialist or craft worker and the rest of them would be much less skilled and would be trained to do one task which could be composed of several different um, subtasks and the craftsman or the person who was capable of generating the product themselves was called a foreman and the foreman would sit there at the table and he would watch each individual person doing each task and subtask and would tightly regulate their movements the time that they were taking their breaks different kinds of things like this to make sure that they were strictly regimented and that the scientific application of the throughput of the item could be monitored this had some profound impact on the way that labor was constructed and the way that the individuals came to uh, interact with their actual job and with their actual work. They were no longer creating individual items that had some sort of imprint from themselves on them and they were now no longer specialist workers with the rise of scientific management, especially as it came to form a little bit later, which we'll get into, the specialization necessarily needed to be reduced because specialization was something that couldn't be accounted for. So the specialization of these workers needed to be narrowed as tightly as possible until it could be something which could be easily quantified. So when they would sit at these tables, they were no longer in charge of their process and they were no longer in charge of their ability to work. It was now up to one person to strictly regulate all of these people at the table to make sure that the uh, analytics and the data could be passed on to a manager who could then use this information to attempt to hedge against different kinds of inefficiencies and to uh, create a new system 
which could be much more directly controlled by the people who weren't actually making anything. All right, thank you very much for watching. This was the first part. We're going to have one more on this one. This is a pretty big topic. Um, I'm trying to do my best to condense it down as small as possible. Uh, but I hope that you enjoyed. So if you did enjoy, make sure to leave a like. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. But until next time, remember, LA and broader.